Okay. We're as normal as it gets. Okay. Oh. Hey guys. Um. So let's just go. We're ahead. hitting record, so we can start. Okay, Brandon's all you. All right, guys. Welcome to the betrayed, the addicted, and the expert. My name is Brandon, and I am the expert. I'm Ashlyn, and I am the p- betrayed. And I'm Kobe, the addicted. All right, so today's topic is is one that that I think is is pretty awesome. Um, the question I get all the time from guys is, "What can I do? What can, what can I do to to rebuild trust?" Um, seems like there's nothing I can do to to make this right. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to give you the answers. What what can you do? How can you rebuild trust in a relationship? And so we have five things that we're going to go through, and Ashlyn and Kobe are going to break them down and talk about them and how they work and why they work or, or what worked for them. Um, so let's jump right in. Uh, the first one is to rebuild trust in the relationship what that's been damaged by sex addiction um, is, is the addict needs to be proactive in his own recovery. So what that means is that, that the wife isn't cracking the whip. Um, she's not working his recovery for him but she can trust that he's going to work his recovery on his own. And so, Kobe, I don't know if you want to speak to this. If yeah. You've been on both sides of it. Uh, yeah, totally. This is, um, not only did I have to face this myself, obviously, but I, I have to, like, this is part of the message that I have for the guys that I mentor as well. And, and this is, I would agree with you, like, key. So, the, the, really, um, when we first started recovery, it was August of 14, and, and I went into therapy saying, I'm not going to tell I'm not going to tell Ashton and, and confess the second affair. I'm going to take that to my grave. And I told that to my therapist. And six weeks later, at, while Ashton and I were both simultaneously, but individually, doing our, doing our own work, um, she said, okay, now you're ready to, to, to share that. And, and I was freaked out. But once I did, um, Ashlyn came, came forward. She said, okay, now we're going to do an in-home separation. And she said, this is what I expect from you. And I was already like... I was already going to group willingly because I, I wanted to do that. I, I, I led us there to, uh, to get specialized help. But, um, but she said, I expect you to do all your dailies without me even saying a word to you. Um, we're going to wake, work, work out at six thirty in the morning and you better be ready. I'm never, ever going to say, um, Hey, are you ready to go or get up? And I expect you to keep these boundaries as well that, that we've, that we've established, you know, to keep us safe. Right. And, um, that was kind of a wake up call for me, but it was a really important one because, um, it was all on me and, and. I had never been, um, I, I don't know, I, I just never been that proactive with really anything in my life where I had, I, I had purely owned it, like purely owned it for me. And so, but, but honestly though, it was, it was um, nice because there was so much turmoil that we were experiencing in that moment because all this had come out, the second affair and, you know, 31 years of addiction, all that kind of stuff. There was so much I couldn't control, especially what Ashley, you were feeling. That it was, in some ways, it was helpful to say, okay, I'm going to take all this energy that I have, all this angst, right. and all this like burning in my soul that I caused, of course, and I'm going to pour it into my own recovery. Right. Right. Well, and, and you know what? So a lot of uh, what you're describing, Kobe, is so different than, than a lot of what I do see, is uh, I see this external motivation. Guys come to treatment, they get help because they want to save their marriage. Um, so they want to do what their wives are telling them to do, and so, and so they're kind of wasting their money and their time um, because they're they're trying to rebuild trust, but they're doing it all out of compliance and all out of, you know, that they're being willed to it by their wife, yeah. and it doesn't rebuild trust. What it makes the wife feel is, gosh, if I were to go out of town, or if I if I weren't around, he wouldn't be doing any of this. So what's the point of it, right? So Ashton, I don't know if you experience both sides of that yeah and I think I think the the first 14 years that we weren't active actively working recovery we were trying to get into sobriety for you yeah, I was for sure I to be honest did nothing like I didn't read a book I did nothing we just wanted it to go away just go away I pray I <laughs> tried to pray it away, away. <laughs> that didn't work yeah. <laughs> uh, no but it was um, I think <laughs> I was present in pushing you and 
and saying, okay, now, so go, go to therapy. If you want help, then you go to therapy. If you want help, you go to your church leader. If you yeah. want help, you go to 12 step. Like this is not my thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so you weren't necessarily doing it for me maybe, you were trying to do it, but it was for the marriage. I think it yes. was more like, let me alleviate some pain and some stress and some turmoil and some strife that we're experiencing. And her stop Not because I wanted about to change. It. Yes. It's like, let's just kind of ease the tension, so I'll just go and check some boxes. Yeah, which, cool. which is much different than you getting in. We talked about that last week. Than, than you getting in recovery. Yeah. Right. Which is so different. Yeah, yeah. for sure. For sure. So. And it did. It, it made me be quiet and stop bringing it up because I thought, okay, well, he's a what doing else, what else something, can do? right? Yeah. 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 So what was it like for you, though? I'm curious, like, how long did it take you to really realize that I was owning? Like, when, when we first, when it we started. It took a while, to be honest with you, because um, I think a big part of it, and as weird as that sounds, is seeing you wake up and, like, work out next to me. We didn't talk. But we didn't. the fact, that was always, that was a hard thing for you to get up and work out. And so for me to say, I'm doing it with or without you. And I'm not going to wake you up. I'm not going to set your alarm. Like, I don't care what you do, but this is what I'm doing to help myself. And to have him, like, join in was okay. kind of a big deal. So, Ashton, what you just said, if, if every spouse could apply that to their husband's, not exercise, but overall recovery, which is, look, I'm going to get healthy myself. I'm going to work yeah. on me. And whether or not you do it or not. But... And, and I'm not going to wake you up. I'm not going to push you. I'm not going to, I'm just, you, you're, if, if you want to rebuild trust, and this is the part of the, the spouse's job, that there's an element of surrender. There's an element oh, of, yeah. I let go, and then I just kind of watch to see what you do. I, I watch to see if you're a man in recovery. I watch to see if you're going to do it on your own. And, and, then, and then the spouse is kind of seeing, are you proactive in your own recovery or not? Right? So they let go. They don't control, but they pay attention. So, which leads to the next one, which is um, you're consistent with your actions and your behaviors. So um, that means two things, Kobe. So it, it means one, you're, you're regulating your emotions. So you're not volatile and crazy with your emotions. You're not up and down and everywhere. Um, that probably took a while. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing it means is that your word means something. That if you say you're going to do something, you follow through and you're consistent with that over and over again. And, um, you know, I've seen really good times. I've seen three weeks of good recovery actually do damage to a relationship because the wife's waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. Like, okay, he's not consistent. He'll, he's good for a while, but then, then what's going to happen? Yeah. So... When, so when I talk about that volatility with your emotions, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure, Kobe, you've experienced, when, you, when you're in recovery, you're accepting life as it comes, you're regulating your emotions. When you're numbing out your emotions, I mean, how consistent are you with your behaviors? I, I don't think there was anything consistent about anything that I did, aside from showering, going to work, coming home, eating, <laughs> three meals a day right. and then numbing out at, at the end of the night. Yeah. Right. I mean, I was pretty consistent with showing up for like bedtime routine, um, for our kids. For sure. Um, but, but I saw my kids two hours in every, in every 24, right. Because of work. Um, outside of that, I was not right. consistent. And, and, and that also, like you said, like you've indicated, it's like it showed up in, in, um, my emotional regulation, my ability to just kind of manage my emotions. I, I really just didn't want to feel. So I was, I was anything but consistent emotionally in kind of being in tune with, in being in tune with what I was feeling, but also like not letting things get to me. I would, I, I was a train wreck really right. emotionally. Right. Yeah. I was talking to a, a spouse last week and she was saying, I can't trust him. He's so inconsistent. He never follows through. And I said, yeah, you can, you can trust him. You can trust him to be untrustworthy. <laughs> you, know, you can trust yeah. him to be inconsistent because that's where that's where he is. Yeah. And and with that, there's no safety in the relationship. Right. No. So. And, and and just to be super clear as well, I'm I really believe looking back on it, you know, when I was in when I was acting in my addiction, I wasn't safe for me either. Like like I was I was also waiting for the shoe to drop. You yeah. could not trust yourself. No. No. In, in, like in any way. Right. And, and I would travel weeks at a time internationally, and 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 I it was just like this 
anxiety-filled trip from the moment that it was planned. Mm -hmm. Because ritualization would start and I would just worry and could I do this again? And what's going to happen when I have to tell her again? And it was just this wicked germ wheel. Yeah, it was it was it was um, horrific actually. Yeah. So you notice those those the volatility in his emotions being less. Have you noticed more oh, yeah. consistency and and yeah and honestly at first it was hard to really trust that like this is gonna last mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was new. This, right. It was all new. Like we're trying something that's hard and requires us to really put forth effort and not just sit back and hope it goes away. And so I would say months before I felt like, okay, he's really doing this on his own for himself if I'm here or if I'm not. Yeah, so, so what you just brought up, Ashton, is, is so important because the question I get is, what, what can I do? I'm doing everything right. I, and, and the reality is, is you're rebuilding trust. And so it's not you do one thing and then you have trust. It's you yeah. consistently do these things over time and then, and then she can trust you over time that you're gonna consistently respond in those ways. Yeah. And that's what creates, creates the safety in the relationship. So, all right, let's move on to the next one, uh, which is pretty straightforward, uh, pretty simple, um, but it's that you're connected to the household needs. And what that means is that your heart and just your mind is, is about your family and your spouse. And if you're, always you know numbing out on your phone or shut down on the couch or just just wanting to watch TV all the time yeah you're not bringing home a paycheck you're not even noticing that a dish needs to be done um, that sends a message to a spouse of look I'm not I'm not here with you you're not you're not that important to me and so being connected to the household is really important and so I don't know how that so I, I hear this one a lot I hear well, he does that one pretty good, but the rest he's horrible at. <laughs> that so. probably described me. I mean, like I said earlier, it was like I was pretty connected. Like bedtime routine was a was a was a big one for us because I saw the girls like I said two hours and every twenty four, and and so being there for dinner and being there for for um, the bedtime routine and so forth. I mean, I was pretty consistent at that. Um, I I honestly have a really hard time remembering. Um, if I sucked or if I didn't have <laughs> household needs. I know for sure when Ash was gone and I would be at home and if I had relapse, I was like deep cleaning. Like uh, moving towards yeah. my penance, right? Yeah. So my household needs became the way of, of like, She'd hey, come home friends. and it was a clean house and she'd be like, no! I yeah. know, seriously, it got that way. I was like, why are you cleaning? Totally What's going on? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, so he, he does help now with the household chores, but I think part of that, it's probably a culmination of recovery and we both work from home now yeah mm -hmm. and so we share the responsibility but before you never i don't remember you like helping with those things no right for sure yeah. very rarely very rarely all right uh the last two i saved these two for last on purpose okay. and they're, they're probably two of the the most important and hardest ones um so the next one is patient and empathetic to her hurt and her pain and so what that means is uh, an addict will not be able to hold their spouse's pain very well um, and empathize because her, her emotions trigger his shame. And so he's not a, he gets defensive to, to her emotions. So if he comes home from work and she's spinning out in fear and, and wondering if he's been acting out all day, um, he'll try to fix it. He'll try to tell her how crazy she is, um, shut her down, or shut down himself and not even be there for her. And, and it, to create safety in a relationship, she needs to feel like, hey, you're there for her. You can hear her, you can hold that space. Um, you're a safe person that she can talk openly about whatever her emotions are. And so, and, and really, the, what we're talking about today has a lot to do with what we talked about last time, which was recovery. What real recovery is, is when, when you can attach and connect in a healthy way. And so, so being able to empathize and hold that space is really important. Yeah, I think the ones that you talked about all were things that I've done, meaning things that uh, being able to, blaming your wife, you're going crazy or, or going to shame or shutting down. I know I did all of those things. Do you remember? Me, me doing that, like being yeah, defensive and, I think, and uh, the, uh, the easy way to describe it is 
turning everything back on, like, this is about me, instead of, wait, this is, I was just saying how I felt, but it turned into, like, it was about Kobe. A turn of, of the tables. Yeah. And, yeah. I and I always thoughts. was crazy. I was the crazy one. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Like, it was me. And, and because I made it. Right. About, meaning I, I manipulated the situation, to be sure. Right. To, to, to heap it really on you and really that's that's what what gaslighting is is that this buzzword gaslighting mm -hmm. it's turn it's that subtle turn of the tables back to them of look you're crazy for the way that you feel yeah. an addict will say no 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 your your emotions are not crazy in fact they're valid and you need to feel them and you need to process them and you need to understand them and I'm here for you to to bounce that off of to to, to hold and so um, that creates safety mm -hmm. um, the story I always tell is I was at a conference and this couple who was in recovery, um, they, they were doing incredibly well and, and you could tell they had this connection and this safety together. And um, she had this boundary of, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to see you naked. That was her boundary. Okay. And so he gets home from work and she's in the shower sobbing, just, just broken down in the shower. And um, he comes in and hears her in there and just goes into the shower. He's in a suit and his tie from work, fully clothed, water all over him, and just holds her while she cries in his arms. And he knows why she's crying. It's about things that he had done in the marriage. Um, but he's just there for her and lets her sob and lets her, lets her, her feel what she's feeling and doesn't shame her about it, doesn't should her, doesn't fix it, anything like that. And so, you know, some relationships are to the point where, where things like that can happen. Mm -hmm. Some relationships aren't. But I, I just think it's a good example of holding that pain for the spouse who's in betrayal. So. I, have I, I mean, I don't, what does it look like for, I mean, from your eyes, what does it look like for us? I don't know that, I don't know how successful, honestly, yes, I've been. Yes, you've been bad. very successful at that. And, um, and it, again, was like this. Maybe it took a year for mm -hmm. us in recovery for me to be like, oh, like this is, it feels different because he's not turning everything back on himself and mm -hmm. the woe is me and I've done this. Playing the it's victim, essentially. Playing the victim. It was like, oh, I'm owning this and I am sorry. And let me listen to how you are feeling and I will own it. That is huge. Yeah. So. Hashtag own it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one, which is very important, obviously. <clears throat> so, so rigorous honesty despite the consequences. Mm -hmm. How do you build trust without honesty? Okay, to be super honest about this thing of rigorous honesty, <laughs> that's the most. That was the most scary thing, right? That for was both, the most I think. scary thing for me. Because to tell, absolutely, both ways. it goes both ways. Because you're not safe. <laughs> no, we were not safe for for the other, but. But for sure, I think that the that the fear, just kind of thinking out loud here, my fear of the truth is really a measure of the depth of my shame. Yes, yeah. yes. But listen to what you guys are saying. So, Ashlyn, you weren't safe, and so you weren't vulnerable and open and transparent with him. Um, he wasn't safe, so he wasn't vulnerable and open and transparent okay. with you. Yet both of you wanted connection, right? <laughs> yeah, how are you gonna get connection? But you're oh, man. you're like you know, you know you're looking at each other in fear. You go first. Like, yeah, that's really what it is. Yeah, yeah. you open up. Show you me your card. First. I ain't showing you mine. <laughs> right. So can I show you one instead of five? Like or half a one? Right. Yeah. That's that's really how I would do. It. I would half truths. Was yeah, my yes. was my standard operating procedure. Let half me test truths. how far I can actually. Yes. That was right. totally me. I was so scared. So I think you guys are bringing up another thing that's really important. Is is when you're the receiver of that truth to be safe, to be able to hear it and validate and empathize and understand. Because if that other person is getting honest about something, something that's difficult, yeah. you know, it's important to be able to listen and, and, and be there as well. Yeah. So, uh, but, but really, how are you gonna build trust and safety if you can't be honest with each other? Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty obvious. That's a, that was a hard, that was a hard, hard road for us. And, and, and the classic examples, what I showed at the very beginning, I went into therapy in August of 14 saying, yes, I'm not going to divulge the second affair with Ashlyn because, because my narrative in my head was if I share that the second affair, she's going to walk. She'll right. leave me. 
right? And that to me was like the ultimate like rejection, and I was I was ultimately most afraid of that. So I have a I, I have a client right now who's who's holding firm to I can't tell her or she'll divorce me. Yeah. And so he has this major relapse secret in the relationship, and I keep telling him, look, your best option if you want to save your marriage, your your only option is the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you hold this, then you'll just disconnect and you'll stay stay separate from her as far as you need her to be. <clears throat> and so how are you going to actually salvage your marriage mm -hmm. if, you tell, if you hold this massive secret from her? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, rigorous honesty dis despite consequences. A couple things about it. Um, if you want to rebuild trust in a relationship, then if you're willing to lie about little things and... You know things that have nothing to do with recovery or whatever, but you're just kind of the lies just kind of come easy. Yeah. That sends a message to the the spouse of like, look, he's he's more than willing to lie. Yeah, you know, he's willing to like be in denial and and manipulate and and so why wouldn't he manipulate me? And so you're not oh, going to create very much safety if you're if you're constantly lying and manipulating. So totally. that was you know. they they're just. It just wasn't safety. But here's what's interesting, though, about the rigorous honesty piece. I knew once we got specialized therapy, and this is one of the reasons why I, I, I decided, okay, rather than going to a traditional therapist, I'm going to find a specialist. Yes. Okay? Um, you know, a CSAP, like you, is because I, I thought, okay, what it, no matter what I share, they will surely have heard worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what it is I share. And, and so just from, I guess, just speaking to the addicts who are listening, um, it, it's just super important to remember that um, that once you find a specialist, there's nothing that you're going to be able to share. There really isn't that they will not have experienced firsthand or that they will not have heard of secondhand and kind of worked through in a case study format. So that means that, that they're going to be safe for you. And and safety is something like, like addiction is like the ultimate lone wolf, lonely road, yes. isolated road. And so finding a specialist for me was like such a relief emotionally. I was so fatigued and so tired right. of, of, of the whole thing of lying and of manipulating, of, of holding up pretensions. It was such a great thing. So finding safety first. If you want to be honest with your spouse, start first with being honest with a specialist who's really going to understand exactly what you need and help you on that road, and you practice being honest with them and yourself before you can be honest with, at least in my experience, before I was honest with Ashley, it's like I had to really say it out loud in a room with the specialist before I could like even consider sharing it with Ashley. But once right. I did, that whole process worked for me. And so right. I guess that's really just a plug to say, okay. man, the right, <laughs> the right, the right absolutely, kind of absolutely. I, I tell my clients when I first start working with them, one, like I've, I've, I've heard it all, you can't shock me. And, and two, I'm, I'm not going to judge you. Yeah. Whatever you say, I'm not going to judge you. I just want to, I want to help you through it. And yeah. so if you can find some, somebody who, who can do that, pr provide that safety, start to open up, just start to get more honest. Mm -hmm. And what you just so, said there, Bren, I, I can, I can mm -hmm. say for sure, having, having, you know, worked alongside you, not just in this capacity with others and being in your groups, it's, that was exactly what it is for me is the and that and that goes to that goes that speaks to the skill that that you have in being able to 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 create an atmosphere that is safe. Like the, there are any dumb questions? There's nothing you can share that, that that I haven't already heard. And that is there, there's no way to quantify the good for an addict that that can do. And right. just saying, okay, here's a safe person. Right. Absolutely. That's a big deal. Okay. So I'm gonna run down the the five things really quickly, and then we'll wrap up. So. First, proactive in your own recovery, okay? Second, consistent with actions and behaviors. Third, connected to household needs. Fourth, patient and empathetic to, to your spouse's hurt and pain. And lastly, rigorously honest despite the consequences. Um, I promise you that trust can get rebuilt. It is possible. And trust is the foundation of, of love. It's the foundation of secure attachment. It's everything in a relationship. So if you commit yourself to those five things, and those aren't five small things. No. Those five things are recovery. Uh, if you commit yourself to those five things, then you're doing everything in your power to rebuild trust in your relationship. 
Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, Ashton, I don't know. What, what's, what safety feel like for you now? Well, not, not necessarily what it feels like now. Only thing I wanted to add was that it, there, stop waiting for a moment to, like, I'm here now. I have safety. I have trust. It's almost like it just becomes. Mm -hmm. And be okay with that process of, okay, it's a little step. Today, I feel this today. And stop worrying about the future. And well, I think you be, you be trustworthy. You don't do trustworthy. You don't, yeah. I'm going to do this, 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 and this to be trustworthy. I, I'm going to be trustworthy. Yeah. And That's super absolutely. good. Absolutely. And, and for me, I would say that the, the consistency, everything that you talk about, the, these, five things, these five points, Brandon, um, for me, the way that I've found my way to them is to be mentally focused every day and to be consistent in my effort. Absolutely. And, and just trust that... I don't need to watch the clock to see what, okay, we've arrived. We're here at no. trust and safety. Yeah. It, it, That's, like you said, it's a yeah. process. And, and ultimately I, I remember looking back, I had to change cognitive behaviors, like in my head, like norms, like ways of living. I had to change the way that I thought, the way that I lived, the way that I defined things. And that takes time. And it takes consistent effort. Right. It takes mental focus to Absolutely. do that. It's so it's not going to be old this. Dog tricks. Yeah, I mean, and that's, it is yeah. possible. It just takes time. Yeah, yeah. sure. It was it was hard, but it's possible. And it's and a if, process. Yeah. If it happened to me, I mean, if 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 I was able, if I'm able to, to live with trust and safety now, it can happen with anybody. Yeah. Right. With anybody. Yeah. So, guys, thanks for being here. Um, you know, this has been rich for us. We're grateful for your attendance. Um, if you like this, share this. We love it. And also pop down to the bottom of the, of the, uh, you can just pop down to where the reviews are. Love to get a great review and any comments there would be fantastic. So um, thanks guys. We'll thanks. see you again. We'll see ya. Bye-bye. All right. How long was that? We are not done yet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, hey guys. It, just so you're aware, I'm going to tag our new page called the betrayed the addicted and the expert us three and we will be posting our podcast you can subscribe to and that way it keeps you off social media if you have issues with being on social media you can listen safely um, through three different perspectives and um, do that so we also have another big announcement that we will be sharing that we're excited for bye guys